Welcome to the Fan of History and Timeline the World History, Part 3, 10,000 BC to 9,000 BC. This is a cooperation between myself, the Fan of History, and Shane Soresby. The cooperation is that I use my nice Swedish voice to read this to you. And he does all the work, the research, the PowerPoints, etc. So thank you, Shane. Okay, we will start our episode 2,000 years earlier. In 12,000 BC, in the midst of a warm and moist interstadial known as the Alleröd Oscillation, temperatures began to increase in the northern hemisphere, leading to a proliferation in forest, environment, forest environments which contained birch, spruce, pine and juniper. Hunters used the covers of these forests to hunt red deer, moose, elk and beaver rather than the mammoth and saber-toothed tiger that were previously hunted during the colder periods of the Ice Age. In the last episode, we covered some of the cultures that had evolved during this warm period in Europe, such as the Asillan, a late Magdalenian culture in northern Spain and southern France, the Feathermesser culture that stretched from northern France to Poland, and the Cresvalian culture in Britain, now you would think that we have seen the back of the Ice Age, and you would be wrong! The warm interstadial period only lasted for 1800 years before events in North America would have a drastic effect on the climate of the Northern Hemisphere. Since 28000 BC, North America had been covered with a vast ice sheet during a period known as the Wisconsin Glaciation. As the ice sheet began to retreat northwards, as a result of warmer temperatures, it created a vast proglacial lake, known as Lake Agassiz, named after the Swiss-born biologist and geologist Lars Agassiz. By 11,000 BC, the lake covered much of Manitoba, northwestern Ontario, northern Minnesota, eastern North Dakota and Saskatchewan with a size of approximately 440,000 kilometers, square kilometers. That's about the size of Sweden, actually. Larger than any lake in the world today. Approximately 200 years later, uh, meltwater started to accumulate in the Red River Valley of North Dakota and Minnesota. As the water reached the top of the divide to the south, it drained into the ancestral Minnesota Mississippi River system, Whilst at the same time, the Laurentide Ice Sheet was located at the current US and Canadian border. Known as the Lockhart Face, Lake Agassiz was estimated to be 758 feet deep, with the southern boundary being blocked by the Big Stone Moraine. As the ice sheet continued to melt northwards, the lake found a new outlet along the Minnesota-Ontario border, entering in a pro into a progressive lake known as Lake Duluth. From Lake Duluth, the meltwater drained further south along the ancestral St. Croix and Mississippi river system before eventually entering into the Gulf of Mexico. In the meantime, during what is known as the Moorhe Moorhead phase, the depth of Lake Agassiz increased from 758 to 846 feet. 846 feet. That's the depth of Lake Agassiz. The result of this meltwater into the Gulf of Mexico and eventually into the North Atlantic would have an effect on the climate of the Northern Hemisphere, leading to a period of approximately 1000 years from 10,900 BC, known as the Younger Dryas. Temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere declined by between 2 to 6 degrees Celsius. Forests were replaced with glacial tundra in Scandinavia. Glaciation or increased snowfall occurred in mountain ranges around the world. More dust accumulated in the atmosphere from deserts in Asia. An increased drought occurred in the Levant, which would affect the existing Nortafian, Natufian culture. These words, hard to pronounce. From about 10,000 BC, in the midst of the Younger Dryas, the Clovis culture began to be replaced by more localized regional cultures. The most common held view for the end of the Clovis culture is that the decline in availability of megafauna, along with an increase in a less mobile population, 
that led to the diffusion of cultural traditions across North and Central America. The theory goes that the Clovis culture used long spears to overhunt and subsequently extinct species of megafauna, which included American horses, dire wolves, mammoth, mastodonts, and saber-toothed cat. What was left were much smaller animals that included bison, moose, elk, grey wolf, caribou, uh, grizzly bear, black bear, deer, and mountain goat. The criticism of the overkill hypothesis was that the human population at that time was too small and not widespread enough to have been capable of such ecological damage. It does not mean that climate change scenarios would explain that the extinction was solely due to this, but it does suggest that a combination of both factors would help explain why such a large scale extinction would have taken place. Now, as we know, the main theory for the cause of the Younger Dryas was the reduction or shutdown of the North Atlantic conveyor due to the influx of meltwater southward from Lake Agassiz, that is uh, the Gulf Stream, right? However, there are a couple of other theories as to what may have caused the Younger Dryas. One competing theory is that there was an impact or airburst by a comet in North America in approximately 10,900 BC, which set areas of the continent on fire, disrupted the climate and caused the aforementioned extinction of the megafauna, as well as the decline of the Clovis culture. Proponents of this theory suggest that an airburst similar to the Tunguska event of 1908, but on a larger scale, would have disrupted the ecological balance on North America, impact, uh, impacting on existing animal and human life that had not been killed by the wildfires. The criticism of this theory is that no evidence of a population decline among the Paleo-Indians occurred in 10,900 BC. There is no evidence of wildfires, and we would see that, across North America during the deglaciation and sediments have been incorrectly dated due to a contamination of modern carbon analysis, making it difficult to establish whether an impact had actually taken place. The other theory is that an eruption occurred at the Lacher Sea volcano in Rhineland Palatinate in Germany. 10, square, 10 cubic kilometers of tephra were ejected into the atmosphere uh, causing temperature changes across the northern hemisphere. However, problems with this theory are that the eruption was actually dated 203 years before the Younger Dryas began, and the amount of tephra ejected into the atmosphere would not be large enough to produce extreme cold conditions. Returning to Lake Agassiz in North America, lake levels and drainage patterns continue to fluctuate during the Emerson phase in 9600 BC. Isostatic rebound combined with changes in the volume of meltwater and the closure of the outlet to the east increased the size of the northern end of the lake. Period of rainfall and meltwater input with the rate of evaporation may have existed for a short period of time with the result that no significant outlet occurred during this phase, causing the lake to become static. At the end of the phase in 8630 BC, the southern outlet that had caused the Younger Dryas effect had permanently closed, replaced by the northwestern outlet through the Clearwater and Athabasca river systems after the ice that had originally covered this area had melted. The Emerson phase of Lake Agassiz would coincide with the end of the Younger Dryas period. We now enter into another warm interglacial period that has continued to this very day. We're in the middle of it, people. Replacing the Pleistocene epoch that had been ongoing since 2.5 million years ago, the succeeding Holocene epoch would encompass the growth of human species worldwide and lead to developments that would change our lives forever. However, that is getting ahead of ourselves, and we need to return back to the cold and look at what was happening in Europe. At the height of the Younger Dryas in 10,000 BC, a late Upper Paleolithic culture known as Arendsburg emerged in North Central Europe, 
covering an area from south and west Scandinavia, north Germany and western Poland, as well as vast stretches of land that are now located at the bottom of the north and the Baltic seas. One such sediment was located at Stelmor near Hamburg in Germany. Occupied seasonally during October, the Arensberg culture used the earliest definitive bow and arrow to hunt wild reindeer in tundra conditions containing arctic white birch and rowan. Archaeologists have also found remains of circle of stones that were possibly the foundation of teepees made of reindeer hides. Earliest traces of habitation in Randaberg in northern Norway and the Hensbacka group of western Sweden date to the transitional period from the Younger Dryas to the Preboreal of the upcoming Holocene epoch in 9600 BC. Favorable living conditions and experience of seasonal occupation led to increased exploitation of maritime resources in more northern areas as a result of the retreat of the ice sheets back to the Arctic. In western Sweden, the dating of deposited bones indicated there was no break in settlement continuity from the continental Arensburg culture with a rapid climatic change stimulating a cultural change rather than immigration. Uh, this is now the period when the Paleolithic or Old Stone Age comes to an end and is replaced by the Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age. One such society benefiting from these improved conditions would be the Swiderian culture, a transitional Paleolithic Mesolithic group that emerged originally in 11,000 BC. Most of the Swiderian population moved to the northeast at the end of the Pleistocene in 9500 BC, following the retreating tundra after the Younger Dryas. Radiocarbon dates proved that some of these groups persisted into the following pre-boreal period of the Holocene epoch. Unlike the Arensburg culture in Western Europe, the Swiderian culture were newcomers into Poland, attested to by a 300 year long gap between the late Paleolithic and earliest Mesolithic occupation sites. For example, the earliest Mesolithic site near Otwok in Western Poland outdates other Mesolithic sites in central and northeast Poland by 150 years. Lack of good quality flint in the Polish early Mesolithic proved that these new arrivals were not yet fully acquainted with the best local sources of flint. This culture would continue to thrive until 8200 BC, when they would be succeeded by the Kanda culture. So we have seen what has happened in North American Europe. Let us have a look at what was happening elsewhere during this, uh, roughly this period. As mentioned in the previous episode, the Kebaran culture was an archaeological uh, Upper Paleolithic culture that emerged in the Eastern Mediterranean in 18,000 BC that was named after its type site of Kebara Cave, south of Haifa in Israel. Now I need to make a confession. Uh, that's shame confession. I actually got the dates wrong for the next culture to emerge. Originally said that the Natufians had emerged in 12,500 BC and lasted until 9,500 BC. That was completely wrong, as this would have had an impact on when the following culture emerged, which we will cover in the next episode and would have led to a thousand year gap between the two cultures. The Natufian culture, an epipaleolithic group, actually emerged in the Levant from 10,500 BC. Sorry about that, people. They were hunter-gatherers who foraged for food, such as wild cereals, legumes, almonds and pistachios. They were hunting gazelle, deer, wild boar and aurochs. These people were semi-sedentary, living part of the year in semi-subterranean settlements with dry stone foundations with a diameter of 3 to 6 meters, containing a central fireplace or hearth. The lifestyle of the Natufians changed as a result of drought conditions caused by the Younger Dryas. With wild cereals becoming fewer and fewer in the Levant, the Natufians had a choice to make. Now as they were semi-sedentary, they could just up sticks and move to newer pastures. But there is some scarce evidence 
that a series of experiments were carried out by the Natufians or other hunter-gatherer groups that indicated the possible cultivation of early domesticated forms of wheat and barley. If so, this is possibly the start of agriculture and the very earliest occurrence. However, many researchers have rejected the idea that the younger Dryas forced hunter-gatherers to become farmers or that the Natufians were precocious farmers themselves. One thing is for sure though, the Natufians would have inspired late generations to go that one step further, but more on that in a later episode. Further north, in southeastern Turkey, an archaeological site was discovered by a German archaeological team under Klaus Schmidt in 1996 until his death in 2014. The site consisted of a tell that had a height of 50 meters with a diameter of approximately 300 meters, dating to between 10,000 and 9,600 BC. Göbekli Tepe, that's Potbelly Hill, is the oldest man-made place of worship yet discovered. At its early stage, the temple consisted of a 10 to 30 di meter diameter circular compounds um, with T-shaped pillars set within the interior walls of unworked stone. And many of the T-shaped limestone pillars contained carved reliefs of lions, bulls, boars, foxes, gazelles and donkeys, as well as more exotic species such as snakes, spiders and vultures. That looks pretty elaborate for... Uh, the very first temple. Still, in a hunter-gatherer society, these people somehow organized themselves to find a way to cut through the limestone bedrock using only flint points and transport these 16-ton pillars from 330 feet below the hilltop, arranging them in a circular pattern for ritual use. Schmidt believed that this was a pilgrimage destination attracting people from as far as 160 kilometers away, that's 100 miles, and that this was an example of the human sense of the sacred giving rise to civilization itself, rather than ecological reasons. The site continues to puzzle and intrigue, raising more questions than answer for archaeology and prehistory, with the result that our achievements will have to be revised and pushed back further in time which e with each new discovery being made. Consider how early this is. This is, this is thousands of years before Stonehenge or the pyramids or anything like that. Pretty impressive. Around 9600 BC, the drought and cold conditions of the younger Dryas had come to an end. A popular camping site near a spring at the Jordan River had already been established by the Natufians once conditions improved, the Natufians decided to extend their stay, eventually leading to year-round habitation and settlement. Still living in semi-subterranean stone structures, these people would sow the seeds for a much larger settlement in years to come that would subsequently become famous in the Old Testament of the Bible. The settlement would be called Jericho, the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world. Next time, Jericho will continue to grow under a new culture that will usher in the Neolithic era. Gebekli Tepe undergoes a transformation from its initial roots. Europe continues under the Mesolithic age with new sites appearing in the UK. And North America sees the successor of the Clovis culture. That and much more in episode 4 of Timeline of World History, 9000 to 8000 BC. Thank you for watching.